Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Manga. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down Good afternoon. My name is Michael Manga. I'm president of the section of AGU called Volcanology, Geochemistry, and Petrology. And I'm introducing our session on volcano science and living with volcanic hazards. Volcanic eruptions are among the most amazing natural phenomena, but they can also be devastating. There are, are, however, new opportunities to better understand volcanic eruptions and make more useful forecasts. This is possible because new measurements can reveal where magma is stored and how it moves. New mathematical models are being developed for the processes that govern eruptions and expanded monitoring from space and on the ground, including new technologies, is filling important data gaps. Altogether, these will lead to more useful forecasts of the timing, the size, and the consequences of eruptions. So today we have a program that highlights the future of volcano science, the challenges, and the opportunities. And we'll begin with a keynote talk by Kathy Cashman from Bristol University. Uh, thank you all for coming, and our session is properly titled Forecasting Volcanic Hazards, Present and Future. Uh, I wanted to start with some definitions. So by forecast, we mean a probabilistic assessment of the likelihood and preferably timing of eruptive activity. And forecasts can be short-term or long-term. And then by hazard, we mean all of the various things that a volcano can do. And that varies with the type of volcano and also whether you're close to or far from the eruptive vent. So I wanted to start by talking about some different uh, kinds of hazard assessment. I'll talk a little bit about what we do before eruptions, about what we can do during eruptions, and then importantly, something we don't often talk about of what happens after eruptions. Whoops. Um, so uh, I wanted to start with a couple of examples of good old uh, field geology, which is still important. Uh, this is a study that came out from last year looking at lava flows that are in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you can see that they're very close to the city of Medina. Uh, the last lava flow here was in the 13th century. And by going out in the field uh, using high resolution topographic data from LIDAR, uh, you can measure the channel geometry as a function of slope. And we can use that to estimate the mass eruption rate. You can take samples, uh, determine the melt composition, the temperature, and the crystallinity that gives you a sense of how the flow rheology changed with distance. And together, those can feed into uh, models or predictive models for future eruptions in the area. My second example is looking at volcanic ash deposits. Uh, we've been doing this for a very long time and are quite good at using proximal and medial data to estimate eruption parameters like the magnitude, how big it was, uh, and the, the intensity or the mass eruption rate. Uh, we're moving now into trying to think more about distal hazards. And this particular example is for uh, looking at the Crater Lake eruption that happened about 7,700 years ago. The, deposit from that eruption covers or blankets the northwest US and southwest Canada. Um, we can map it out to about 1,500 kilometers from the vent. And the challenge of looking at older deposits is you've had a, a lot of secondary reworking. So we're working in ways to identify secondary versus primary deposits, uh, use spline fits to look at the thickness and the volume, but then also compare it with environmental estimates or maps from the time to understand more about what's causing that secondary reworking, uh, which is, poses post-eruptive hazards. Um, once you have the geology and you know the area, then you can start to do uh, different types of probabilistic hazard assessment. And this is an example from the Campi Flagre area near Naples. Uh, here, you've had a number of eruptions in the Holocene but from different vents. So to do a hazard assessment, you need to know the probability that you'll have an eruption in a specific place, and then uh, include the various types of volumes and model the interaction of 
density currents with topography. A uh, second example is more like the earthquake hazards that we were hearing about, which is looking at exceedance probabilities. Uh, and this is specifically looking at hazards of ash fall. Uh, ash, of course, can be transported far from an eruptive vent, so it crosses country boundaries. And by looking at the range of, of potential eruptive vents, the eruptive frequency, and wind directions, you can build up models of the probability of ash occurrence. And this is obviously important for designing flight paths, but also for uh, taking predictive measures in terms of uh, the impact on people. OK, once an eruption starts, uh, our job isn't done. And there are various types of syneruptive hazard assessment we can do. This example is from the Kilauea eruption last year. And at the time where the lava flow front was at the star that you can see, then uh, there were probabilistic models that were performed to look at, at where the flow might continue and what the flow path might be. Uh, so this, the models were done on May 27th. And the black outline that you can see is where the lava flow was on June 3rd. So again, by doing these predictive models, then the communities that are potentially in the way, uh, you can uh, protect infrastructure and, if need be, evacuate well before the lava flow gets there. Probably one of the <coughs> most wide known and, and uh, and troublesome hazards relates to these far-traveled volcanic clouds. Uh, volcanic clouds produce gases, and Tobias Fisher will tell you a little more about that. But they also carry a lot of ash for very long distances. And ash in the air is a problem because airplanes tend to run into it. Um, ash on the ground is a problem for human health, uh, for transport, and in proximal areas uh, for building collapse. So I don't have time to go into oops, um, all of these models, but I thought I'd show you this one example that was done a couple of years ago. It was looking at the question of, once you have a model for uh, where the ash cloud's going, what's the most effective way to communicate it? And this shows three different maps of, for the exact same hazard. It was from the Iceland 2010 eruption. Uh, but you can see the maps look very different. And a group of scientists and a group of uh, aviation experts were asked to assess whether or not they would allow uh, flights to use four different flight paths. And interestingly, uh, for the, the highest danger flight path, then people who just saw the polygon were more likely to allow planes to go through that than if you had those big red blobs in the middle. So red blobs are important. Um, in contrast, when you just had the polygon, then people were more cautious for a medium to low risk flight path that just barely touched the polygon, uh, whereas the contour maps, you can see more clearly that uh, that flight path would just barely graze the edge. So people were less conservative. Um, ash is also a problem on the ground, and there are fewer models or fewer uh, people who are actually doing predictions of ash fall on the ground syneruptively. Uh, this is important during the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Then there were problems with ash fall up to 1,000 kilometers from the vent. Um, for example, in Billings, Montana, where they closed schools the following day. And yet the people out of sight of the volcano were not aware at all that they had to deal with this stuff coming out of the sky. And I, I show another example uh, from the Askia eruption in Iceland in 1875, because I, sort of ironically, uh, we have a better understanding of what the distal ash cloud did in this eruption than for almost any other eruption where you approach it for Mount St. Helens uh, because someone very studiously collected eyewitness accounts. And here in Stockholm, which is almost 2,000 kilometers away from Iceland, they were still having uh, enough ash that there was 
it was affecting vision. Um, it was covering glass frames uh, from the glass houses. So uh, this is something that we could actually do better. And another synoruptive hazard uh, that we don't tend to forecast is shown here, uh, two examples from the, the last couple of years of lava flows interacting with surface water. Um, in one case, there was a BBC crew up on Mount Etna, and the lava flows um, caused, covered the snow and, and caused a secondary explosion. Uh, during the Hawaii eruption, there was a tourist boat offshore watching the lava flows, and there was an explosion that injured 23 people. Now, I handed in, I think we all handed in our slides before hearing about the uh, eruption in, in New Zealand yesterday. Um, so I didn't talk about that, but that was a different type of, of water-driven eruption uh, that sadly has killed several people, and uh, we'll probably talk about that later. Uh, there are also lots of hazards after eruptions. Uh, these are some images from Mount St. Helens, and the density flows, or the pumice flows, went down river valleys, and during the summer of 1980 in particular, there were explosions uh, as pockets of water were heated up to the boiling point. And in the slide on the, or the picture on the right, all of those little pockmark holes are individual secondary explosions. The image in the upper left is an explosion that occurred a year after the eruption, and it was some geologists who were out in the field <laughs> who saw that one. So uh, these can, can be quite hazardous and for quite a long time after a given eruption. Um, when you have a big eruption, then you put a lot of very loose, fragile, and movable material onto the landscape. So for a long time afterwards, you have trouble with volcanic mud flows or lahars. And this is an example, again, from Italy, looking at, um, from past eruptions of Vesuvius, looking at the probability of different amounts of ashfall in the area around the volcano, and then using rainfall records uh, to try to forecast what areas would be most susceptible to these mud flows after the eruption, uh, just triggered by rainfall events. Another post-eruptive hazard that uh, has been more on people's minds recently uh, relates to resuspension of ash by wind. Uh, the picture in the upper left is a satellite image of Argentina. Poor Argentina is downwind of Chile. Chile has all the volcanoes. Uh, but it not only gets ash during eruptions, but because you have a very high desert area, there's a lot of movement and a lot of secondary ash problems. And these, again, can persist for a very long time. The image in the upper right is a picture of an ash resuspension event in 2003 from an eruptive deposit that was formed in 1912. And that particular event was enough to shut airports. Just to give you a sense of what these uh, ash resuspension events are like, the photo behind is from Iceland. A friend sent it to me. He said it was a beautiful clear sky day until he drove into this secondary ash plume. Uh, and the other long-term effect of eruptions, Anya Schmidt will be talking about, uh, but we can, uh, eruptions can cause problems for years afterwards in either regional or global climate. Okay, the last little bit, I wanted to move on to forecasting more generally. Uh, Short-term forecasting is what we do typically when a volcano starts to show some signs of unrest. And we can do probabilistic assessments, but also trying to move to more physics-based models of what might happen. And ideally, we'd like to be able to forecast the start of an eruption, both the timing and hopefully the style. Uh, the evolution of eruptive activity, because eruptions often go on for quite a while and have uh, very different types of activity. And then we'd also like to forecast the end of an eruption, and that is surprisingly hard to do. Uh, so just a picture globally, uh, at any one time in the world, there are many volcanoes that are showing signs of unrest, uh, seismicity, ground deformation, 
uh, degassing. And this shows three different studies, uh, but the, the bottom line of these is, on average, about half of volcanoes that show signs of restlessness uh, eventually erupt. So that means half don't erupt, and one challenge is to tell if you have a restless volcano whether or not an eruption will occur. And Juliet Biggs will be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, when a volcano becomes restless, one of the first things we tend to do is to develop what's called an event tree. And each limb in the event tree, you know, will it uh, erupt, will it not erupt, will it be magmatic, will it be phreatic or water-driven? If it's magmatic, will it be produce lava flows or explosive? Um, and ideally, each point in the tree, uh, we'd like to have a probable a probability assessment for, and that's typically done by a process called expert elicitation, uh, which weights the experts um, with their opinion. There are also different event trees that instead of weighting the expert, you'll weight the quality and availability of monitoring data. Um, there are also Bayesian belief networks that people are starting to use to get a sense of what might happen. Um, I wanted to put this slide in. This is a paper by Gordon Wu that just came out last year. And Gordon Wu has uh, taught me the value of counterfactual analysis. And this particular example, he looks at uh, challenges or information that lies in knowing about time periods where a volcano has been restless but didn't erupt. And so this particular example is Sufria Hills volcano in Montserrat. Prior to the 1990s, the previous eruption was in 1630. However, in the 1890s, the 1930s, and the 1960s, there were fairly intense seismic episodes. In fact, in the 1930s, there was a magnitude 6.2 earthquake associated with it. And so Gordon points out two important points. That first of all, the fact that you'd had all these seismic episodes without eruptions uh, affected people's perception of the volcanic hazard when the volcano became restless again in the 1990s, because they're like, oh, we've seen this before. Uh, but it also affected the scientists' perception of probabilities. And Gordon's point is that if instead of just saying the last eruption was 350 years ago, you say, well, each of those seismic crises had a finite probability of turning into eruption, then your perception of what might happen in the 1990s is quite different. And in fact, in the 1990s, we did have an eruption that then lasted for 15 years. The final point I wanted to get to is long-term forecasting, uh, <clears throat> which is based on historical and geological data. And this is challenging because of what we don't know. Um, although ideally, from planning points of view, we'd like to know or have long-term forecasts for global data sets, for regional data sets, and even for individual volcanoes. So when I say what we don't know, um, I thought I'd give you some examples of unknown eruptions. This is a figure from a, a wonderful paper by Michael Siegel, where he combines tree ring records of temperature, global temperature for the last 2,500 years, with ice core records of what are called volcanic aerosol forcing, or, or sulfates that show up in the ice core that are symptoms of large volcanic eruptions. And each of those red spikes with an X is what they think is a, a large volcanic eruption. Most of them, we have no idea where they were. And why is this important? Well, among other things, uh, that period particularly in the 6th to 8th century, there have been suggestions that changes in climate because of these volcanic eruptions uh, could have promoted the rise of Islam, uh, the collapse of the Turkish Empire, and the exodus uh, from Mongolia. Uh, so major migrations because of this eruptive activity. So a couple of looks at uh, long-term global forecasting. The histogram in the top is from a paper by Chris Newhall looking at VEI-7 eruptions, but these are eruptions we know about, and he's looking at the repose intervals 
Um, we've worked with a statistician to try to account for underreporting, and we find if you take into account all the eruptions, what we think we don't know about, um, then actually the hazard or the probability of very large eruptions uh, increases dramatically. And in fact, we think that super eruptions or magnitude eight eruptions may occur as frequently as every 20,000 years. So what's next? Uh, there's a lot of work going on on developing a physics-based framework for forecasts and models of eruptive systems. Uh, we're also more and more using data assimilation and real-time monitoring data, um, and I think Kyle will tell you a little bit more about that. So um, although we're making progress, there remains a lot of work to be done, and again, uh, I think all of us are in our minds um, really upset about what just happened in New Zealand and thinking that we have to do better on that front. Ladies and gentlemen, Juliet Biggs. Okay, and so for, for most of uh, human history, the only way to observe volcanoes has been from the ground. Um, but uh, these days we have uh, new techniques that are available. We can actually use satellites to observe volcanoes. Um, and there's two advantages to doing this. So the first one is that we can observe volcanoes uh, anywhere in the world. And that often means for remote or dangerous volcanoes, the only observations we really have um, are, are satellite images. And the second reason is that we can actually use these satellite images to generate long time series of baseline observations. So Earth observation data has been available for about 40 years. And during that time period, we think we've um, managed to observe satellite, um, using satellites unrest at about 80% of the volcanoes that have erupted. Um, so this um, monitoring by satellites has really taken a big step forward in recent years uh, through Europe, the launch of Europe's Sentinel constellation. So this is a constellation of many different types of satellites um, which distribute their data freely um, to the whole community um, and, uh, and on a routine uh, acquisition schedule. Um, so there are six different satellites, and using these, we can actually observe um, the majority of volcanic phenomenon. We can observe emissions of gas and ash. We can observe um, surface thermal anomalies. We can map surface deformation and surface um, eruptive products. The one thing we can't do is actually study earthquakes. We still need ground-based seismometers in order to be able to do this. Uh, so with this explosion in the, the number and the type of satellites out there, comes a reduction in the amount of time you have to wait for the next satellite overpass. So back in the 1990s, you might have to wait over a week before the next satellite pass. These days, it's much less than a day. And that means that the timescales um, of our observations are much more compatible with the timescales required for real-time monitoring and decision-making. And the best example we have of that uh, to date uh, is from the 2010 eruption of uh, Merapi. So at this time, really the only way to make obs visual observations of what was happening at the volcano summit was by using radar satellite images. And this image here um, shows the growth, the very rapid growth um, of a dome at the summit of the volcano. Um, and actually six and a half hours after this image was taken, that dome collapsed um, and caused a, a very devastating pyroclastic flow. However, those six and a half hours were enough time for the image to be acquired, processed, passed on to the volcano observatory, who made the decision to increase the evacuation um, zone out to 20 kilometers. And that decision is credited with saving many thousands of lives. However, with the new opportunities come a whole range of new challenges. We have to have a way of managing these millions of images that are now being produced. Um, and many organizations are now turning to automated processing systems or on-demand processing systems. Um, and we're seeing a rise in, in machine learning and data assimilation approaches to help with the um, interpretation. Um, what have we learned from looking at all this data? Um, well, the first thing is that our very simplistic model of a magma-filled balloon really doesn't hold with the observations that we now have. Um, our observations are of um, multiple magma reservoirs that are all interconnected beneath single volcanic systems, and that's much more compatible with a modern idea of a transcrustal magma system. However, when we come to try and interpret uh, multi-parameter data streams, the situation becomes a little bit more confusing. Um, so recently, the USGS PAL Center brought together a group of experts in different types of satellite-based monitoring to try and help understand these, these systems. And between us, we managed to combine, um, combine uh, our observations of 47 different volcanoes in Latin America, observations of degassing, thermal anomalies, and deformation um, to produce 20-year time series. 
Um, and when you first look at these time series, you think every single volcano has a completely unique pattern. How are we going to make any progress with a conceptual model here? But actually, by dividing these um, time series into segments, classifying them, we can put together these multicolored barcodes that you see on the right here. And these actually cluster together quite nicely into just four groups and 10 sub subgroups. However, if we're going to uh, move beyond these sort of simple conceptual models, we need to develop physico-chemical models uh, for actually in um, integrating these observations in a quantitative way. Um, and the most obvious place to start is to try and integrate observations of deformation and degassing. There are some simple ways to do this. You can use SO2 as a, as a proxy for magma flux, but this kind of thing only works in very specific types of circumstance. If we really want to be able to do this in a more general sense, we need to start looking at petrological and thermodynamic models of volatile solubility, because this controls both deformation and SO2 flux. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Diana Roman. Can we start at the beginning? Okay. All right. A hundred years ago, only three volcanoes on Earth had permanent ground-based instrumentation. Fast forwarding a hundred years, dozens of volcanoes now host permanent instruments, and a handful of volcanoes actually have very dense networks of multi-parameter, uh, multi-sensor, uh, networks. Uh, in addition to that, the recognition that uh, seismic um, signals contain significant information at low frequencies had led to the advent of broadband seismometry on volcanoes, which allows us to uh, study the signals at a, a range of frequencies. Similarly, early records of instrumental geodesy are now able to be combined with modern, modern records leading to uh, very long, very valuable and rare uh, long-term records of volcano deformation through multiple eruption cycles. The most, arguably the most significant advance in volcano geodesy has been the advent, the, the uh, launch of GNSS constellations, which permit uh, measurement of ground motion at ground-based receiver points um, on the scale of millimeters, so remarkably sensitive. In parallel, paradigms for eruption forecasting based on data from ground-based instruments has also evolved. Uh, now we currently use a paradigm of uh, pattern recognition, as Kathy mentioned, um, and in some cases probabilistic assessment of, of the, what those patterns might mean. But I'll note that this is a paradigm that was developed in the 1960s and, and has not really changed substantially. Um, and as Kathy noted, there really is a need uh, to move to more sophisticated methodologies. However, what has advanced significantly in this realm is our abilities in signal processing and the ability to uh, extract very subtle signals or signals out of very noisy data even in some cases when the seismometers or other instruments are not local to the volcano. Similarly, we've made major advances in our understanding of the sources uh, of volcano seismic and volcano geodetic unrest, and in recent years have moved away from very simple elastic half-space models to sophisticated models that incorporate realistic rheologies and structures of, of the sources of the signals that we, we are able to record. In the past decade, the advent of volcano infrasound has demonstrated amazing and exciting potential for near real-time characterization of explosions and plume dynamics, uh, often using very distant, very sparse regional networks, and has in recent years actually begun to demonstrate the potential for forecasting changes in syneruptive behavior based on changes in infrasonic signals. Despite all of these advances over the past century and decades, most of the world's volcanoes host no ground-based instrumentation. Um, even among those that do, even fewer have data that are available uh, publicly. 
Furthermore, there's a sharp imbalance in the distribution of ground-based instrumentation on volcanoes, with some volcanoes hosting uh, world-class dense networks and most volcanoes being monitored only by one or two ground-based instruments. So this has been greatly compensated for, as Juliet discussed, um, by our advances in remote sensing and abilities to use satellites to detect uh, precursory signals and synerruptive activity. Um, however, there still remains a need for ground-based instrumentation. First of all, satellite-borne sensors are sensitive mainly to large signals, often the ones that are produced during eruption and not before. Second, as Juliet noted, we have no mechanism for doing volcano seismology or volcano acoustics from space. While INSAR especially has greatly improved both its resolution and uh, decreased the latency of, of um, interferograms, there still remains a strong need for ground-based GNSS receiver instrumentation on volcanoes. First off, in cases where the deformation signal is larger than the available ground mass, only GNS sensors, GNSS receivers, can tell us about absolute rates of uplift and magnitudes of uplift. Furthermore, many key volcanic processes that produce significant and meaningful deformation signals can occur on hourly or shorter time scales. Finally, I want to conclude by noting that recent hindsight analyses of forecast accuracies have very clearly demonstrated that what's needed for accurate eruption forecasting is proximal ground-based instrumentation. And again, like Kathy, I apologize that I put my slides together yesterday and was not able to include a slide on White Island. But I do want to make the point that while this is necessary, it is clearly not sufficient. White Island had a very good ground-based network, and the problem is we still don't understand if and what type of precursors we need to be looking for prior to phreatic explosions like the one that occurred um, yesterday and tragically uh, took several lives. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Tobias Fisher. So Friere de Guadalupe erupted in 1976, and that was most likely due to a magma intrusion event. A spring that is located close to the crater was sampled for the water composition, and that spring showed high chlorine and high magmatic chlorine concentrations with isotopes five years after the event. Over the next few years, that signal from the hydrothermal system was washed out and went back to normal. Mount Ontake has a similar spring close to the crater and it was sampled for many decades for helium isotopes without any change. Then a few years prior to the phreatic eruption, the helium-3-4 ratios started to increase. That was interpreted as an injection of new magmatic fluids pressurizing the hydrothermal system that then finally led to the phreatic eruption that killed 60 people. In both of those cases, the injection of magma and magmatic volatiles changes gas compositions, in this case sampled by the springs. This is because the solubility of volatiles is pressure dependent. So if we have a ratio of two gases, like in this example, CO2 and SO2, at high pressures, the melt will show a high ratio of those two gas species. As that melt moves to shallower levels, CO2, because of its lower solubility, will come out of the magma earlier and the ratio will decrease. The gases that we can monitor in real time, ideally, will exactly mimic that behavior. So the ratio will decrease due to magma degassing. If you see an increase in carbon sulfur ratio, that could mean you have injection of new magma that could potentially be a trigger for the next eruption. The Arica volcano shows that example. The ratio of carbon to sulfur remained at around one for about a decade 
prior to an eruption. In late 2014, a continuous gas sensor system was installed right at the crater, capturing the last part of that stable ratio before the ratio jumped up by an order of magnitude right prior to that explosive eruption. When you have a hydrothermal system, like at White Island, the situation is a little bit more complex. You still have CO2 and SO2 coming off the magma, but now sulfur dioxide is going to interact more readily with the hydrothermal system. It's more soluble in water, and therefore it will be absorbed by that hydrothermal system, and the gas that comes out on the top is going to have a higher CO2 SO2 ratio over time if that process continues. If you all of a sudden see a decrease in that ratio, that might mean that you have a significant magmatic input that overwhelms the hydrothermal system, and that could indicate a future eruption. At Poas Volcano, a continuous sensor system monitors the carbon to sulfur ratio over time. And we see that over several years, the ratio remains stable, but generally goes up until in 2017, when there's a sharp drop in the ratio prior to an eruption that is caused possibly by such a massive injection of, of new volatiles. After the eruption, the sensing continued because the sensors were placed on a different location or drones were used to continue the sampling of volcanic fluids. So new technology like continuous sensing allows us to get much, much denser data, much higher time frequency, and also allows us to approach fumaroles, like here in the case of Tavurvur volcano, Papua New Guinea, to continue collecting samples when it's too dangerous to approach uh, the volcano. In this example, we collect gas in a sample bag that is then taken back to the laboratory and analyzed for carbon isotopes. And the carbon isotopes can tell us perhaps whether the carbon is of magmatic or mantle origin or if it is of superficial origin. So future developments in geochemical volcano monitoring should be uh, including continuous monitoring, obviously, but also ground-based uh, sampling techniques to get more detailed information on the magmatic processes that lead to eruptions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Anja Schmidt. Okay, so in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk to you as to how volcanic eruptions influence the climate and what challenges and opportunities this entails. Okay, in the early 1780s, it was Benjamin Franklin who actually made an ingenious link between the presence of a volcanic aerosol cloud that originated from an eruption in Iceland, the 1783 Lakia eruption, and the changes in weather and climate that he observed during the summer of 1783 and the coming winters. And I quote him here, during several of the summer months of the year 1783, there existed a constant fog over all Europe and great part of North America. Hence, perhaps, the winter of 1783-84 was more severe than any that had happened for many years. And whilst others made similar remarks and uh, created similar linkage, we can really uh, consider that as the inception of the field of volcano climate interactions. In terms of the history of this field, I also want to point out the seminal work by Hubert Lamp, who is a British climatologist. And he used observations to establish a very clear link between the occurrence of a volcanic eruption and the cooling of the surface. In the plot, you can see that following volcanic eruptions, there's a dip in surface temperatures. By now, we understand the mechanisms behind this forcing of climate fairly well. We know that volcanic aerosol in the atmosphere scatters incoming solar radiation. If in the stratosphere, the aerosol absorbs some of the terrestrial outgoing radiation, and that leads to a heating in the stratosphere. For most eruption, the net effect is a negative forcing that is expressed as a cooling. And this is really because the scattering by far exceeds the absorption. 
And in terms of the cooling, the magnitude, um, peak cooling for most eruptions is between 0.3 and 0.5 degrees Celsius when averaged over the entire globe, and the cooling lasts for one to three years on average. What's important is there are also indirect effects, uh, for example, on large-scale circulation. Both observations and models clearly indicate, for example, a reduction in the Asian and African monsoon circulation. And this has important implications in terms of hazards. This reduction in circulation uh, may causes changes in precipitation and can lead to crop failure, for example. I also want to point out that over the last two decades, we recognized the role of smaller magnitude eruptions much more. And we also recognize that effusive eruptions, like the ones at Kilauea, for example, have important implications for uh, low level uh, properties of low level clouds, for example, and they can also um, induce a regional climate forcing. I think one of the main challenges relies in the fact that over the instrumental period, there have been actually only a few large magnitude eruptions, and therefore we rely really heavily on climate models to, first of all, to understand the responses, the climatic responses to a volcanic eruption, but also to establish the significance and the robustness of these responses. And I would argue that by now, climate models are really good tools to understand the climate response to a volcanic eruption. But of course, they are not perfect. And this is an iterative process. So with each eruption, we learn something new. And this can help us to improve these climate models. But in the meantime, while waiting essentially for another eruption, we should make use of the data we have. And we can analyze these data in, in clever ways. So this is a figure um, based on, on data from my former PhD student, Lauren Marshall. And she built a statistical emulator based on output from a complex climate model. And this emulated surface shows the global mean rated forcing for eruptions at different latitudes and of diff for different SO2 emissions. And the point I want to make here, we can sample the surface of this emulator much faster than we can run a climate model. So we can use this to predict the likely impact of uh, the next eruption within seconds. And to conclude, we already heard um, from previous speakers, we are now really entering the era of big data in volcanology. We have ever-increasing ground-based and space-based monitoring of volcanic activity, and importantly, also of the volcanic effects across different scales. And given that climate models are sophisticated tools to simulate the climatic response to volcanic eruptions, we are now able to forecast in almost near real time the impacts of a future volcanic eruption on climate. And hopefully this can help us to mitigate the hazards from these eruptions. And this is just an example that you see here from the June 2019 Reykoke eruption. These are high resolution satellite data of the sulfur dioxide cloud. And I was able to use this within less than 24 hours to run a simple climate model to predict the maximum global mean temperature change, um, which is fairly small for this eruption. But this gives you an example of what we can do. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacob Lowenstern. Well, it's clear that we've made tremendous advances in the understanding of magma, its transit through the crust, and its eruption. Yet we continue to face enormous challenges in keeping people safe from volcanic eruptions. Even in countries with state-of-the-art, uh, you need, need to go back to the beginning on the slides. Even in countries with state-of-the-art monitoring networks and sophisticated software and protocol, it remains difficult to agree upon why, when, and how people would be evacuated if an eruption seemed likely. I've been given two related topics to discuss in my five minutes today. One is capacity building. How do we assist global volcano observatories so that they can sustainably fulfill their mission of keeping people safe? The other topic is outreach, or really the broader topic of communications. Even if we have ideal scientific understanding of the volcano, is that really enough to mitigate volcanic risk? There's no doubt that many of the world's most dangerous volcanoes are considerably under-monitored, and that wealthy nations can, improve, can provide important scientific resources to assist with global volcano readiness. I'm going to focus a bit on equipment, but it's clear that capacity building goes way beyond mere equipment and can include remote sensing, modeling, field work, 
or best practices. With respect to equipment, the following questions are pertinent. What equipment is needed to provide adequate understanding and warning? Who's going to pay to acquire the equipment and maintain it? How does the data get to the observatory? Who's going to pay for the telemetry? Most options have recurring costs. How safe is the equipment from lightning, insects, corrosion, vandalism, and theft? Is the observatory staff trained and experienced to interpret the data? Is the observatory staff paid well so that they remain in their jobs for the long haul? And finally, and hinting at the second half of this talk, is the observatory recognized as authoritative, and is it integrated into the national framework of civil protection in its country? If any of these questions lack answers, or the answer is no, then the attempt to build capacity may fall short. Here are suggested guidelines to aid volcano readiness. If you're setting up equipment, try to make it permanent. Make sure the data go to those enabled to make pronouncements about volcanic activity. Many university collaborators will not have such authorization. Try and make it a true collaboration where both sides gain something important and both sides are stronger as a result. Think about sustainability. How can we ensure that the training or the equipment will be useful in 10 years? And think about institutions and not only colleagues. Both are important. Let's talk about communications and outreach, but within the context of public safety. There are at least five critical factors necessary to protect people during volcanic eruptions. And only two of them, the red ones, really involve science. Even with reliable data and powerful models to assist with interpretation, it's frequently not enough. We need to make a forecast that is understandable to the public and contains actionable information. We need to do that through some sort of official communication release or volcanic alert level distributed by the legally enabled observatory or geological agency. Pronouncements by the lone wolf who rejects the party line, even if that person is Pierce Brosnan, are only likely to cause confusion, animosity, and catastrophe. If you're not working with the acknowledged and enabled voices for the relevant agencies, you're not part of the solution. In very few places worldwide are geological agencies or observatories empowered to call for evacuations. That means that the observatory needs agreements, cooperative memoranda, and frequent exercises, practice scenarios, and discussions with those charged with civil protection. No matter how good the science, if the civil protection agency isn't confident, convinced, and trusting, the geologist's forecasts will go nowhere. Even if everything goes right, the scientists do their job, they relay the message, and the government announces an evacuation, the people can always refuse to obey. Most volcanic disasters have an important subplot where people who don't want to leave their homes or to abandon their livestock. This is to say that science is only part of the solution, and yet scientists are a crucial part of the community that can improve outcomes, not merely through better science, but through recognizing all the other things that need to go right, and to try contributing to efforts to improve the institutions and protocols that keep people safe. I'll end this uh, presentation by showing a slide from the recent Volcano Observatory Best Practices Workshop, which took place two weeks ago in Mexico City. And through this triennial workshop, volcano observatories get the opportunity to share experiences, recognize challenges, and collaborate on defining ways to improve capacity building and outreach to protect vulnerable populations. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Anderson. Almost all short-term volcanic eruption forecasts are based on identifying patterns in monitoring data. The question is, why don't we forecast eruptions the way we forecast the weather? Uh, weather forecasts are based on physics, they are fully probabilistic, and they assimilate or incorporate new observations as those observations become available. So in principle, this is a relatively straightforward process, right? If we know the condition of the volcano, 
and we have a deterministic model for the way that volcano or that system evolves with time, we can just let that model go forward and we have a forecast. Um, this is a bit like setting a wind-up toy on a table, right? If you know where you set the wind-up toy and you have a physical model for where it goes, you know where it's going to end up. Of course, in reality, the situation at volcanoes is significantly more complicated. We don't actually know uh, the physical or chemical conditions uh, beneath the Earth. Uh, weather has an advantage, right? You can fly an aircraft through a hurricane or through a weather system, and you can actually measure the parameters of interest, the properties of interest. Uh, there's no way to do that for a volcano. In order to interpret or understand the, the, um, the details of the system at depth, such as the uh, pressure, temperature, or stress state in the volcano, we have to use monitoring data at the surface. And those data are inevitably, uh, they're inevitably imperfect, and we have to use models. So in other words, the state of the system is imperfectly known. Now, volcanoes are complex nonlinear systems. And as a result, the bad news is that even small variations in the initial condition of the system can result in very different future outcomes. Uh, consider, for instance, how a um, small change in the initial volatile content, the water content of a magma, can very strongly change the ultimate outcome of the eruption. Furthermore, our models are also imperfect, and I don't need to tell you this, uh, but there is no one volcano model, right? We don't have a single model that can explain really the vast diversity of eruption styles that are observed across planet Earth, or even sometimes at the same system, uh, really within a matter of minutes or hours. In fact, what we typically do is we develop a model or a model of the volcano after observing the data. And this is clearly not something that works well in a forecasting approach. Uh, to make matters worse, the, the triggers, the failure thresholds uh, that govern the onset of an eruption, for example, are really poorly understood and they may even be external to the system. Uh, the events at White Island in New Zealand yesterday are an example of how little we understand about the, the very short-term triggers that cause eruptions to occur. As a result, once again, our models can diverge very rapidly from reality and very significantly, and that's assuming we're even modeling the right system to begin with. Uh, having said all that, there is, I think, there is a significant cause for optimism. Uh, first of all, monitoring data are continually improving. Uh, in particular, I think of importance for forecasting are better and better observations of repeating or episodic behavior at volcanoes. This is an example from Axial Seamount uh, off the west coast of the US. Uh, repeating activity gives us an opportunity to develop, refine, and test our models, and that's really critical. Uh, additionally, our models themselves are getting better. Uh, I'd like to highlight, in particular, the ability of models to predict more and more types of observations. Uh, these multidisciplinary, multi-physical models allow us to use those different kinds of observations uh, to better infer the state of the volcanic system. Um, Data assimilation has really exploded in popularity uh, in, in volcanology over the last few years. So let's imagine we want to forecast the evolution of a dome forming eruption. We have a physical model for that process, for that eruption, and we have two data points. What we can do is we can run an ensemble of models, and these ensembles are conditioned on uncertainties in the uh, initial condition of the model, that is the state of the volcano, and also in the data. And we end up with a probabilistic forecast that's conditioned on those uncertainties. This is like a little bit like having thousands of these little wind-up toys that we allow to, we start at slightly different conditions and allow to run forward in time. Then we get new observations and we can run a data assimilation algorithm and that allows us to improve our understanding of the volcanic system and improve the forecast. Uh, this can be done in any number of techniques, but the good news is that some very sophisticated techniques are already available from weather and hurricane forecasting, ensemble common filters and others, and these are increasingly being applied to volcanology. So I guess the, the question is, uh, how do we actually use model-based forecasting in practice? Um, I wonder how many of us would actually be comfortable trusting lives and properties to the outcome of any particular model. However, I think maybe thinking of physics-based or, or model-based eruption forecasting as a paradigm shift is perhaps a little bit of a mistake. And what we need to do instead is think of adding model-based forecast to an existing paradigm. Uh, as Kathy said earlier, forecasts are typically, short-term forecasts, are typically made using something like a logic tree or an event tree. And these frameworks allow us to incorporate all available information from the geological and historical record, uh, pattern recognition, increasingly machine learning, and expert opinion to produce a unified forecast that takes advantage of all available information and doesn't rely too heavily on uh, any particular uh, set of observations, or in this case, uh, model data assimilation. So I think with a, a unified holistic framework like this, 
Uh, with, with luck, I think it's reasonable to suppose that model-based forecasting will actually be a useful and practical forecasting tool in the 21st century. Thank you. All seven of our speakers did a fantastic job today highlighting how much we have learned, but also emphasizing that there's still much that remains to be understood, and many of our speakers highlighted the tragedy in White Island. Uh, owing to time, we, we're not going to have a panel discussion here. We have room nine around the corner to my left reserved for this panel discussion, and the panel discussion will include all the speakers today who will talk both about issues related to what they talked about uh, in their presentations as well as the White Island event and volcano tourism. But let's go ahead and thank all our speakers for their effort and great talk.